I will begin proceedings by acknowledging the traditional custodians of this unceded land on which I am presenting this evening, the lands of the Wurundjeri, as the Wurrung peoples, members of the Eastern Kulam Nations, and I pay respects to their elders, past, present, and those emerging, and to all indigenous and Torres Strait Islanders witnessing this presentation. Here at the Faculty of Architecture, Building, and Planning, we want to acknowledge and to affirm that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people had, and still have, laws and laws that predate colonization. As built environment and design experts, we join in their responsibility to care for country and to thank our traditional owners for sharing their knowledges. This evening's lecture by Ben Van Berkel is, in a way, a present or a gift. I got a phone, oh, well, I got an email saying, Ben's going to be in town. Would you be interested in Ben giving a lecture at your school? And I said, absolutely. And so it comes to pass. Ben is here and able to join us this evening. He has a few other events in Melbourne over the course of the next few days, but he expressed a desire to be able to give a public lecture, and particularly for the benefit of students. I know that not all of you are students, but maybe we're all students in one way or another. And so we discussed a little bit about what that might be about, and hopefully tonight there'll be, a, there'll be a presentation with Ben, and then he and I might have a small conversation, and then we want to open it up to questions and discussions from the audience, at least for a while, as much as we can. I, could, I have a whole big four pages of biography for Ben, talking about all the projects that UN Studio and Van Berkel and Boss uh, have completed or, or worked on, the huge number of books and publications uh, that are very important and certainly have been very important in schools of architecture, both with students but also as teaching material and aspects that uh, we use in some of our design studies and design teaching in the architecture program, definitely. The places that Ben has taught in terms of places like Columbia University and Princeton University and Harvard, and of course, importantly, his 15 years as dean at the Berlage, uh, uh, sorry, not the Berlage Institute, but the Städelschule in Frankfurt, which was really important. And I got an opportunity to go there when Ben was, and the students were having some reviews and see the work of the students. It was a really amazing place. It's actually incredibly sad that the architecture program at the Städelschule has closed down because I think what Ben had set up there was really very important in a generation of young architects coming out of that experience. Most of you know the work of UN Studio, and certainly in Melbourne now, we will have in the future at some point, not too far away, we'll have a project by UN Studio in association with Cox Architects, uh, which is the project for South Bank by the Beulah uh, Group. And so I think we'll get an opportunity, not just to see the building, but actually to see how the architecture of UN Studio tries to activate something more than just building construction and tenancy occupancy and residential units and so on and so forth. There's something else that's going on there. And I think the, my sense from the outside of why UN Studio was chosen as the design architects for uh, the South Bank project was because it was actually imagining something uh, that's given back to the city in terms of a kind of complex organization, particularly in the way it, uh, uh, it, it situates itself as a new urban domain on the South Bank itself. But I thought I would just start with one little small anecdote here, and I don't know if Ben will remember this or not, but in October, of 1983, uh, Raoul Bunsoten and myself were new intermediate unit masters at the Architectural Association. We had just completed our graduate degree, our master's degree of architecture, and we had come to London to teach at the AA. And if you know how the AA works, you put up the different studios, the units as they're called there, and you do a presentation, and then you sit in your office and wait to see which students are interested in studying with you. And you might get a lot of students, you might not get very many students, but even the students that come and see you are also talking to other 
studios. And there's a kind of negotiation and bargaining that has to go on. And you know, the really good students with good portfolios, you try to grab them and hold them and, and compel them to put you down as their first preference. The smart ones never do that. They keep everybody at second or third preference until they can figure out where they get the best deal. So for 24, maybe even 36 hours, Ben Van Berkel was a student of mine. <laughs> and then he changed. <laughs> and he went to study with Jenny Lowe, another important Australian architect who left Melbourne, went to the AA, and had a very important career there. Just to complete the circle, she was also, Jenny Lowe was also one of the five shortlisted architects for Federation Square. So she came back, I came back, I stayed, she went back to London. Anyway, it's just to say that Ben was really just starting to study architecture in 1983. I think he had done a year before at the Rietveld Academy. And so when he came to the AA, he came into effectively the second year, worked through the third year. Then he did his diploma, of course. He got an honors degree, uh, honors diploma at the AA. Spent a bit of time, uh, I think, working in Zaha's office. But then very soon after, started with Caroline Boss, uh, Van Berkel and Boss. But interestingly, Ben, even though he was a student of architecture in 1983, he had actually already written and published a number of articles on architecture. So he was already a known, maybe not well known, but he was a known architectural critic before he started studying architecture, which I think is a quite unique quality of Ben. So I'm going to stop there. It's really here to listen to Ben and to hear about the projects, but more importantly, to hear about the process of the projects and the process of the office of UN Studio. Ben Van Berk. I almost forgot that story. Um, that, that's a very... That's a very beautiful story. Also a bit an emotional story for me because I, I remember that it was not so easy as a young student. I was uh, maybe only 25, uh, what was in that time a quite old student maybe. Uh, but, but, but it was uh, a, a school where, it, I mean, I don't want to call it anarchistic, but it was really, you know, you had to fight for the right place. And if you, would not go, if you were not good in the first year, as you remember, then you would, the half of the whole group would fall out and then uh, leave, leave the class or leave the school. And that happened in the second year the same, and the third year the same. So it was, you know, it was an unbelievable, um, uh, quite a fanatic uh, place. But that was steered by a uh, dean who was called uh, um, Alvin Boyarski. Uh, but he would also uh, pick uh, the right students. And I was one of these, um, uh, I was having the, the bad experience, maybe in a way that he would see me, he wanted to see me every month to see how my work was <laughs> progressing. So you have to imagine a dean of, uh, I don't know how many students there were, maybe around, maybe 300, 400. Uh, he would then pick maybe around 40 students in, in, the, in, in, in the school and then individually test if you were doing right, if you were working hard, if you would uh, really push the boundaries. And it was, uh, you know, it was, it was so fantastic because in a way, year by year, you would learn uh, like crazy. Like when I came in Zaha's class, I was, it was very funny, but then I stopped with uh, the, uh, telling stories about the AA, the Architectural Association. But when I was in Zaha's class, what was the most amazing is that Zaha didn't accept uh, uh, 12 students, and that was normal in the time, around 12, 40 students. <clears throat> she said, no, this year I take only four. And I said, no, 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 you can. Now, and I'm not going to teach in the school because I'm so busy. She said she was preparing an exhibition and she wasn't working on that, in that time on the peak. And probably everyone remembers the f one of her first major uh, competitions she won. Um, she said, I'm, I'm going to teach from home. And, and I said, no, 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 you cannot. Yeah. But, but she got it all through. And um, I was luckily en enough there to, to be a student for her. Um, but, but she had something with the Dutchman. Uh, she, she, liked, um, she liked me to, to, to be the coordinator of the class and then would call me uh, sometimes in the afternoon and would say, uh, Ben, could you, um, 
could you call the other students? We have a tutorial. You have not been here for another four days, five days. You have a tutorial tonight. And buy a chicken on the way. When you, <laughs> buy a chicken on the way when you come to, this, to my house. I said, what do you mean? Why do we have to buy a chicken? She said, yeah, then we're going to cook. So, then we, so that was the way how, you know, that was a total different time. So we were, I learned <laughs> cooking from Zaha. That's maybe the, the, the conclusion of this. Um, Thanks for inviting me. It's true that I like to uh, be here because of, first of all, students. I like to teach. I like to always um, talk about the profession. I, I've never been interested so much only in my uh, own uh, practice and architecture, but I've always been interested in the profession. And that's maybe where I'd like to talk about tonight. And, and, and that's maybe what Don also maybe um, stimulated to, to do, to talk about the history of the practice of uh, uh, UN Studio and and as uh, Don said, uh, we, um, we we uh, set it up uh, UN Studio out of Van Berkel and Bos because we thought when we set it up Van Berkel and Bos that it was a quite uh, traditional organized office and we believed in in collaborating. We never believed in the architect who would just just sell the project to to the client and say this is my project that's what you have to buy and otherwise I'm out or whatever you know we, we believed in working with the top specialist and and finding a strategy <coughs> to to work with with the best specialists where you could work with uh, work with the, the specialist from the client side also but the specialist uh, on the level of um, you know engineering uh, sustainability um, even we have lately developed so many specialisms in the office where we even work uh, now today with uh, futurists to think about where the world of mobility and uh, housing or living and, and working is going to in the next 10 to 20 years. And don't forget the reason why we did this because we learned that especially when your projects become larger that you don't um, that you don't work for tomorrow. You don't build or you don't design as an architect for tomorrow. Often projects take five to eight years to 15 years to get built. So that's why you have to learn to speculate. And, and that's maybe my argument. If you no, don't learn to speculate as an architect, then, then, then it's quite difficult to, to be aware and to be part of, of a contemporary uh, condition where you are part of when you are, are making um, parts of cities or uh, projects in cities. So, and as you know, um, we, we have um, a diverse portfolio. It goes easily from infrastructure towards um, mixed-use projects or, or from a museum towards train stations or even product design towards urban design. But we have always believed that it is important to also dare stretch the potential or the, um, the, the position of the role of the architect in a direction that, whereby you could stretch up your own field. And the reason why we do that, why we were interested in this idea is simply because when you know a lot about infrastructure, user groups and, 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 and flow uh, of how people walk and, and move from one part of the station to the next station, um, then you could use that technology or that idea or the knowledge, maybe better to say, than also for another project. And, and that's why, uh, maybe you can see that already in this image, um, we, we have never believed so strongly in, in uh, a fixed style, as uh, we sometimes know that in, in the profession. We have always believed in, uh, and actually today when we had the conversation with the client, that question came up, why not interested in this style? And, and I said, yeah, style is outdated. And then everyone had to laugh because you know how can be a style out of out of out of out of touch of his time? But I, I mean by being not connected to a style is simply because I think we should, as architects, also be open to liberate style, in in a way whereby we think more of the way how you design for people, and for 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 the users, and, and maybe the essence of architecture that has been always or a major argument is related more to the organizational principles of architecture. So if your organization works really properly and when you invent new ideas around the, the, the way how you move through a building or how the building is organized in a particular manner, then, then the architecture falls always in its place. 
So um, once we said, uh, who cares about um, who cares about the box? <laughs> who cares about the blob? Uh, let's be somewhere transformative between the way how we can work with the expression of the internal qualities of yeah, maybe a more human-centric uh, uh, position the architect can take towards um, any form of uh, stylistic uh, image-oriented uh, reference. Um, but over the years, um, we have learned that, that through our work, um, talking about uh, the, the, the span of how long uh, projects take, they also become more complex. Uh, I forgot to say that. So if we collaborate, uh, we, we, of course, want to teach ourselves how we can improve new forms of production. And I will talk about it later on. So from an earlier project you can see here in Raffles, uh, we had uh, 10 years to, to build that project. And even there, we uh, had already in that time, in 2008, set up our own 3D modeling program. That um, BIM was not fully available, but we made our own 3D programs. And over the years, uh, we became more and more efficient towards that uh, level. In order to be more integral, as, as you know, uh, you know, somewhere in the 90s, in the beginning of 2000, we all used these different machines. But yet we have a far more integrated world right now. And, but yeah, but as we know, the, the building industry or the profession, I better say, it's not only us. We, we, are, we can say that we are in the iPhone phase and the building industry is in the Walkman phase. But that, that is not, not what I'm actually saying here. I, I believe that we, um, as a profession, have to uh, improve uh, new forms of manufacturing, you could say, or new forms of the way how we can work more, um, not efficiently together, but more effectively together, whereby uh, modular, circular, uh, sustainable techniques could make this integral uh, uh, quality of architecture possible. But that means that you cannot just start with a sketch and do your work alone and then, and then give it to the draftsman. And, and today, when you design with a project, we have learned that it is much better to have an end-to-end -end service oriented uh, set of specialists uh, you need around the table in order to be fully sustainable. Because if you don't know how to, to produce uh, energy with a building, and you have that not in mind in the beginning of the process of design, then, then you lose a lot of uh, uh, qualities in the way how you, uh, um, you go through a process of design. And the challenges are amazing today, you know. I mean, it's unbelievable what, what, the, the, what for transitions we have to deal with. And, and maybe uh, in Holland is quite uh, particularly also a country where maybe we have to deal with a lot of regulations where, like you see here, in um, 2025, uh, the country wants to be totally energy neutral with all the buildings we produce. It needs to be circular, fully circular in 2050, and 10% uh, productivity in increasement is actually necessary because we have um, 2 million houses to be, especially houses, uh, we have them uh, to be built there. Uh, uh, before uh, 2050. So 2030, a million, and 2050, two million. Because there is an enormous amount of housing shortage. So, so maybe this aspect going from the linear uh, towards the circular, maybe we could argue, is, is a topic I will come back to, but, but it needs to also be connected to new forms of economical models. Because we, we have learned that the clients we work with they sometimes might have the difficulty to understand that if you make your building energy positive, that okay, you have to invest in that, but that it will generate an enormous amount of value towards the end of uh, the project, um, and especially when it is used uh, after, after several years. Um, and it's the same to be said about uh, the way how we have to um, work with circular principles and modular circular elements in a building, because you can attach and a an, an credit list of, uh, or a, a material passport towards it, and then connected to uh, economical values as well. This, so this circular thinking around economical models in the building industry, or in, the design, in our profession, better to say, is something that is coming up quite intensely. So, so talking about the network, the specialist, is, is one thing we started with in the early uh, 2000s, 90s, 2000s. 
uh, but later on we, we moved it to it's also the way how um, I explained maybe um, quite fragmentedly the aspect of knowledge, how you share knowledge, how you cross virtualize knowledge and how you could combine it within the way how you practice. So from a linear model towards a non-linear thinking model whereby you integrate knowledge within the way how you uh, design or, or, or books don't always write there, they, they always were proactively um, thinking about how the practice could change. Most of the books like MOVE, uh, Knowledge Matters or Design Models, they were all books about the way how we wanted to develop the practice uh, ahead from where we were staying because often yeah, maybe we wrote it partly for ourselves to, to make a manifesto of where we believed the practice should move to. And, and I've always believed in, in the dialogue, even uh, here with, you know, you see with uh, Zaha, uh, Patrick Schumacher and, and some uh, friends. Uh, and this time, I think it was, was in, in uh, where was this? This was in China. Um, this was actually uh, a moment where also a client was interested, like the Bula Cloud client we have here, was interested in open dialogue, knowledge management, and ideas and innovation. Uh, this client was similarly having that idea that it would be so good to have uh, conversations there where the client could even be part of a discussion of where the profession might uh, move to. And, 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 and we always did this as architects or as artists or as scientists, like uh, the picture on the left. You see Freud with um, Ekon Schiele and um, Klimt talking about the, the future of uh, uh, psychology and painting. And I've always believed that, that, that it is good to know where the cultural edge is of the profession. And I'm, I'm not going to go into the cultural edge of uh, architecture tonight, but, but don't forget that topic. That, that is actually where I think you can give another layer towards architecture whereby you surprise or bring, bring people back to the architecture. <laughs> Uh, by making sure that, that the architecture is not only about the practice and, and efficiency or knowledge alone, but that it needs to have also a cultural edge. Um, so one of these earlier books, MOVE, was, was about this principle of, of organizational principles, of how you could move uh, through an, an house, like, like the Möbius house. Uh, the house was actually based on Strange enough, in that time, when we're talking about the mid the 90s, and how it's about living and working. Uh, here, the two clients, the, the father and the mother of two, two children, they were interested in a house where they could both work, but they didn't want to be sitting next to each other, so mm, as, as, as much as possible far apart from each other, but that they would actually, uh, during the day, always meet and uh, lunch and, and, and eat with, uh, with the kids in the night. Uh, but but um, they were interested that they would, because they were grown-ups, the kids. Uh, they, the funny thing is that they said to me in the earlier phase of the briefing, they said, yeah, we'd like to see the kids, but we don't like to hear them. <laughs> yeah, so that was actually quite an... Uh, so but that, that's why we made the, the, the facade like a Möbius structure, turning from the inside to the outside, and um, separating some of the um, inner rooms uh, or even um, semi-public uh, uh, areas where, um, they, where you could always see everyone in the house. Uh, but, but you particularly are not walking as a Möbius structure through the house alone. You, walk, you do a walk in the landscape because you have always the connection with the four corners of the, of the landscape around the house. Uh, this is another book we, we wrote later about design models. It, I mean, it was quite a speculative uh, book, but, but actually now we use it in what we call a codification of design systems, uh, whereby we talk about um, the bigger details in a building. So don't make too many big de details, but uh, stretch the building ambitions, not up to 22 ambitions, but come up with three big uh, major details, and then the rest will fall into its place, is our argument again. Um, but here we already predicted these ideas of how design models could move from one project to the other and be tested and seen if they could work and be improved over, over the years. Uh, and of course, uh, be connected towards the brief and the context of the location. And this is what we always did, uh, working together um, and, and experiment with each other in workshops and have uh, a catwalk then afterwards 
and then everyone could present its own uh, ideas uh, of the work uh, they did in the team uh, uh, of that day. Um, so stimulating collaboration, stimulating innovation, stimulating uh, yeah, social interaction is what I've always believed is the, the essence of a good uh, practice. But like I said, the speculative has been fascinating for me. I, I've uh, always um, been fascinated in if someone asks us about the Hyperloop, uh, can you th think with us about what the future of the new station would be of the, of the Hyperloop, then, then we do it, then we do these studies. Or what is the future of the ring around cities when we drive all electric cars? Can they, that's the project on the left hand side. <coughs> Uh, you know, when we have electric cars, maybe the sound is less present, so maybe we can live again around the rings. Whereas now the ring of an, of, of, of an, uh, of an area around the city is a bit the backyard of the, of the city. In the future, maybe they become attractive boulevards. So where are we going to with food, food production, with energy production, um, with the way how we deal with water, etc.? So the, eco the innovation ecosystem of UN Studio is quite complex, but it is very, um, very simple on the other hand. We, we, we have the design and then we have the knowledge and future oriented part on the right hand side of uh, the studio. And uh, we are lately in all kinds of new experiments related to, like I said, um, experiential uh, design or experience design as it is called later, or design thinking. Um, thinking about the future with futurologen, futurists, sorry. Um, and like I said, we have these internal UNS talks also to stimulate the internal uh, dialogue. So when we started with, with uh, working with new technologies, this is the mid 90s, um, where we worked on a 3D program developed by ourselves, a coordination system for the design of the bridge. Uh, you know, we went like scientists into the knowledge of how the first cat machine, look at this machine, it's like a, a miracle that you could have that in the office. Now it's so common and, and it's so beautiful to have all this new technology, but in that time, you know, it was a huge investment to, to have someone working on a machine, uh, but on the other hand also to have that machine uh, producing this project, the Erasmus Bridge, and we were, with this new technology, so influential to the building industry because the building industry he was fascinated to use this similar technique for lasering um, or um, cutting the steel work for this uh, bridge in a 3D uh, program and later on we did the same for the Mercedes-Benz Museum uh, this was our own uh, 3D uh, modeling uh, uh, strategy whereby um, the client was suddenly uh, looking over the shoulder of our work when we had a studio in Stuttgart saying, what are you doing here? Yeah, we are coordinating all the 3D models for, for all the uh, different contractors in the project. And he said, but you know, I, I have a very expensive uh, management office who is all doing all that coordination work. Why, why, why do you do that? We said, yeah, it's more efficient. We can update the whole model for everyone in three days. They couldn't believe, that, or especially one guy couldn't believe of the client side what we were doing. And he, um, he halved, half-sized the management uh, team on, on the building side for the project and, and we, we were, suddenly we were uh, having full coordination o over the whole project and this is what I sometimes think is the fascinating aspect of the role, role of the architect that you, we, we sometimes we think we lose a an, an concept of control in the way how we design uh, uh, with, with clients and the specialists we work with but you can gain it back by having te the techniques under control. Like the project, when you are in the building, it looks very complex, but it's very simple. There are only two to three, um, well, sorry, four, it goes up, um, uh, four major, um, um, we call it modular elements, we casted the building with. So that all the casting techniques could be moved up. So it is not fully modular in a traditional sense, but it is a modular system that we use in the casting techniques to build this project uh, within uh, close to two years on a quite and uh, difficult uh, site. But, but today, I mean, with BIM, we can go full cycle uh, with uh, yeah, daylight uh, calculations, energy calculations, um, financial calculations. We, we, we now we are truly uh, incorporating as much as we can 
in the 3D modeling techniques uh, as possible. And like I said, even we are now studying how we can connect it also to economical models. But the modeler has been always been of fascination, I want to uh, emphasize. Today, modeler design, modeler thinking, modeler ways of building give, give the opportunity to uh, the building industry to, um, to make a building more circular so that you can, can take things apart again over time. Uh, and for that, we make manuals like you can see here. For instance, for these stations, for the four metro lines, 33 stations, we designed one major manual of f close to 2,000 uh, pages for all the elements in the whole uh, project. But with this, we designed only four stations, um, the underground, um, a cross station, a both station, and a cross and a both station uh, stapled on, on top of each other. Uh, but, but you could vary in sizes, uh, adjust, divide towards the location with this uh, model uh, design manual. And we had to do it simply also here because we had to work with eight different contractors. And, and eight contractors, he had close to four, uh, 300 to 400 different subcontractors. So that's something you could never control as an architect. Or in this project, maybe you know this, is in Singapore we used 17 different model elements, but we mirrored the, the model elements. So, so we, we think always of a model element, what can be stapled or be uh, bridged and uh, uh, used as a Meccano system, but you can now do so many interesting forms and, and, and uh, yeah, uh, articulations within a building, whereby um, you, can, you can use this modular technique in a far more uh, uh, interesting way. So data has been always been fascinated for us, but now we use even data in, in neighborhoods where with a data platform, the data stimulate people to produce in, in energy with each other, but we use the data in a um, cyber technology way so that it stays with the neighborhood, that, it, that through blockchaining, that you, that you help each other in order to produce food, to produce energy, and to make a communi community what is actually um, using data in order to have a better analog world, you know, and this is where I believe that tech, uh, data, so working with data is going beyond, for instance, here the BIM model technique, but it's more user, again, user-centric orient, uh, human-centric oriented. Um, data here is actually used for the practice of the way how you can stimulate people to do things with each other, and that is I mean, so necessary, we, we know, uh, for our society today, uh, because you don't want to live in a monofunctional area anymore where you don't meet your neighbor, neighbor etc. But I show you, and then I finish, my last uh, project, um, because otherwise we have no time for a conversation. Um, um, it's the uh, latest project we did. It's a multidisciplinary um, uh, faculty building in uh, Delft, in, in, in Holland. And what is interesting about this project is that, that the client said to make it as open, as flexible and, and transparent, or transparent in the sense uh, that everyone is allowed to come here and teach for all the professors at, at the U whole campus of the university. So in a way, this is a meet and uh, yeah, checking out place, social place in a way for, for professors, visitors and particularly the students. So whenever you do a PhD, you can come here, you have to book a table. Whenever there is a lecture, uh, then you can come here. But what is the most important here is that we use the building as, as a learn by example uh, project. Whereby um, we, say, we, yeah, we say everything here about the future of space making. Uh, the building is energy positive. It is um, having um, everything uh, based on the levels of uh, health for the students, so uh, physical health, uh, social health, and mental health. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that we have the bare air, air systems in here, uh, used uh, also in hospitals, whereby the air goes from the floor out directly into the ceiling, so the air would not move from person to person. It's almost, uh, if you walk through the building, that you walk outside. Um, um, we have uh, active design introduced here, whereby you can't find the elevator, 
You have to walk all the way, way up to the, with a big major staircase. So walkability is stimulated here. Um, and and um, especially the social interaction between the different uh, people is also uh, introduced here. So, so through this green uh, roof uh, or um, energy uh, producing, uh, pro producing roof, we were able to uh, make a building that could also give energy to the buildings in its uh, surroundings. You can see that here. You see the students coming up and down when, when uh, they leave or go to a lecture. Uh, the lecture halls are to be separated. The biggest one is for 750 people, but it can be chopped up in different uh, smaller lecture rooms, as you can see. Um, there is a debate room where, where you don't have to frontal teaching anymore. I mean, this is the latest thing in uh, Holland. Don't use frontal teaching anymore. Uh, have the students and everyone around you, like in a debate room. And it's also good for the student to learn these techniques. And a lot of daylight and, and uh, yeah, biophilia uh, to be uh, introduced around the building. And it's um, really a project uh, by example. People love to come here. They like to come back. They like to share knowledge. They like to um, learn from other faculties. For instance, if you are interested in health, for instance, and architecture, then you can talk also to the medical departments uh, or medical students and see if you can get them involved in, in your project, etc. So thank you very much. I have another, you know, two other projects, but I, I think it's better to have a conversation. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for that. And um, I guess uh, there's a couple of things. The, the first one is to say that I, I think we can say this. One of the reasons you're out here is you are setting up an office. I noticed on the, the beginning it lists all the places where UN Studio has an office, and you now have Melbourne as an office. Um, and that's obviously for the South Bank project, but it's also for more than that, I'm assuming. Yeah. We you want to say anything about that? Well, I mean, maybe you know that also, if you set up only a, an office for one project, that, that's not very healthy for, first of all, um, the whole practice uh, on many levels, but it's also much um, more, more interesting for the, for, for the innovation and the practice itself to have a bit more different things going on mm. than only one project. But, but of course, it's going to be quite an intense project over the next couple of years to work on this. So you will have not everyone experimenting with other projects or doing other projects next to one project. But, but at, at least that you can talk about, that you see other things around you, I think that's um, I think it's been always help, healthy, I believe, for the, for the practice. And we did that in other locations too. Mm -hmm. Like in, you know that in Shanghai and in Hong Kong, <coughs> we use also these tec similar techniques. We copy more or less the UN Studio model towards another location if, if, if it is possible. Right. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about, um, uh, you know, when, when, when you get a big office and you have multiple uh, locations for, for the offices as well, there starts to be a question of, well, who's, who's running the project? Both in terms of how project is generated, and I, I'm interested because, you know, you, you talk about UN Studio in terms of the sort of uh, laboratory aspect, the experimentation aspect, the research aspect, but then also the question of um, not so much authorship, but participation. Mm -hmm. You know, can you know every project that's going on? Can you know about every project that's going on? Are there only certain projects that, that you put a lot of time into and others are handled by other people? How, how, do, you, how do you balance a pro, uh, an office that has multiple centers uh, other than just being on the plane all the time? That's a good question because, uh, you know, um, I had to learn that over the years how to be more effective and more um, um, selective, maybe also. And, and um, not that I select only a few projects, I, I try to still be involved in many projects. Um, but what, what, uh, what I had to learn is to focus more on design instead of uh, management because I thought that I could always also manage for 50% the whole office in the ag. That's what I've learned over the last years when you go beyond 
and 100 people that you cannot do that anymore. So I've now, since a year, a half year, we have an, a real serious manager, managing director. I never had that. All right. Okay. Uh, we always, or partners, were doing, you know, the top partners who are having a stake even in the company, they, they did HR and, and, you know, the financial coordination or, you know, the whole management of the office. And we have learned that, that by that we, we were mm, mm, not focusing enough on the practice or the knowledge where you are good in it yourself. So, but, but I, if you would see my meetings over the day, they're quite amazing. I do them stand up, 20 minutes for each project, and, and I don't see the the project over maybe the two years, uh, or over one year, I should say, not not every week, but every two months. Uh, but in the beginning, a little bit more. I'm I'm difficult. I would say in the beginning and at the end, at the end, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, in, in brackets. Yeah. Um, um, because I, I I think that if your mission or your vision in the beginning is not clear, and and that's not only my head. I try to stimulate and motivate people. I. I'm maybe next to a designer, my best other um, uh, maybe talent is to motivate people, mm -hmm. to just make sure that everyone puts his mind towards maybe that idea of not going for 22 ambitions in one project, mm -hmm. but to make sure that you really go for the essence of the location or the essence of the brief. You know, I, I mean, I've had, you know, I can honestly say that 15 years ago when I would go around the project and ask the team, do you actually know the brief of the client? Mm -hmm. they say, yeah, but, uh, yeah, is it not so that we can go 20 meters high? Or whatever. So sometimes they have not even not properly read the brief. Mm -hmm. so, so now we go, and, and then you have to also do your own interpretation of the brief. What is it what, what you think you can do in order to make the, the brief each, each time more rich for the client so that you add things towards it? So these things we discuss. But, but, but I keep them very short, these meetings, and, and, and with everyone there. So interns are there, they can say something, they can pull up a sketch as well. So, I mean, it's a very open, um, open process. Mm. But, 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 but I'm learning, I'm still learning. I, 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 at the moment, I, am, um, I, I know that I, have to, my, I need my time for reading. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you are not yourself stimulated by new ideas, of, of things you're fascinated in, like I maybe mentioned here and there, then, yeah, then you cannot motivate people, for instance. Mm. If you, if you not, you know, I, I, I think that architecture is somewhere between art and airports, I always say. Mm -hmm. You know, so the efficiency of yeah, the yeah. world and yeah, yeah. of the machinery of an airport and on the other hand, art, but so, you know, you, you need to know that all. Yeah. And what is, I'm, I'm curious, I mean, there's been a lot of talk, you know, almost everybody. Uh, we start some conversation saying, okay, what, we have, what have we learned from COVID? What yeah. have we learned from the, the situation? And it's interesting, some of the topics that you define as where we've transitioned from something. You know, in looking at UN Studio, when, when I'm teaching or working with students, I must always refer to UN Studio, particularly in terms of issues around the diagram. Yeah, which I think has been fundamental, certainly for a period of time. The the notion of how the diagram is a specific form of knowledge, and the role of the graphic of the diagram of providing. It. So I'm curious, where does that sit for you nowadays? What, where, where within you in studio do you see that, and and has COVID and our relationship to working under COVID changed the way you practice and the way you work? It's, it's a wonderful question because I, I think that COVID changed a lot in or uh, thinking about the future of work, uh, living, like I showed in the project, um, mobility, um, people especially, you know, of course, how, how loneliness was actually so part of our culture, even in the office, you know, people felt so alone. So, um, yeah, I think it made an enormous uh, influence on, on, on the future of our practice. Mm. But it's the same to be said now about the whole discussion of, of uh, where we are in uh, lately. You know, the whole energy crisis, that, that, mm. that is not, not easy. I mean, we are living in quite a harsh time. But, but it gives, uh, on the other hand, opportunities to rethink how we deal with energy or how we deal with um, yeah, the world around us, and how, how can we translate that in our practice is an uh, important one. The diagram is, is still there, the idea of the diagram. 
And, and you have to, I mean, maybe uh, some of you might know, but, but the whole thinking around the diagram was actually coming up um, out of uh, some philosophers we were, we were, of course, reading in the 90s. Uh, you probably all know them, uh, from Foucault to, to Deleuze, etc. But, but we were all always interested in philosophers and, and thinkers, maybe we should say thinkers, um, who gave an opportunity for the way how you could uh, think differently about uh, architecture than, than just starting with a typology, you know, etc. So I wanted to break open typological thinking or uh, stereotypical thinking, maybe I should say, in mm. architecture. And the diagram gave me an enormous amount of freedom, suddenly to, yeah, to see an, an image of an, of an organizational structure where I thought, wow, well, maybe this could be a building or an organization of a building. <clears throat> and um, as Deleuze described it, I remember, uh, as an abstract machine, you can, you can add things towards it. And it's the way how you put your, and, uh, your imagination into things. But, but, but don't forget, I do that with a lot of other things too. Um, um, and I, for instance, I'm lately very interested in all the abstract expressionist uh, painters of, of uh, the fi 50s and the 60s uh, in America, the, especially mm -hmm. the women. Mm -hmm. The women painters, not so very well known, like, um, um, yeah, there's this group of women who, uh, Gosh, I know it floats my mind. Suddenly, sorry, but 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 they they had a particular way of thinking uh, about color field painting, mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. um, um, whereby you know color field paintings were in that time already taken up by other artists, but they 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 were in a way um, some of the painters were actually coming up with ideas who were um, in that time so new that. Um, yeah, that I think that they should be rethought in the way how uh, that could have an influence on, on, on the way how we think about space, for instance. Mm. So, so thinking about space, art, or science, art, and, and architecture is, has been always my, uh, uh, inter having always had my interest. Like one of the paintings I'm thinking of now is Joan Mitchell, mm -hmm. do you know the name? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so she, she was actually an artist, um, being heavily influenced by um, de Koning, mm -hmm. um, but, but in a way she was the first one who come up, came up with ideas. De Koning learned from her or the other way, you know, mm -hmm. later on the other, other way around, put in the history books, yeah, yeah. Uh, etc. So, so, um, so, I mean, that's having yeah. also an influence on me right now. And do you, th I mean, it's interesting because when I, you know, the, I mean, in a way, there's a very quick kind of history as well. You start off with the Erasmus Bridge, and um, and I think when when you're talking about diagram and stuff, it seems to also lend itself very well to what we might call infrastructural projects. Yeah. And I think UN Studios become very interested. In, I mean, certainly all the work with the Arnhem Station. You know, and really looking at these multiple flows. You talk about airports wanting to be somewhere between art and airports, and I think our airports as a infrastructural device are very, you know, they're very powerful in terms of not just the connectivity, but the multiple layers. You know, layers that can't overlap, layers that can, layers that merge from one into another and stuff. So I'm, I'm curious, is because it seems like you do have a particular fixation on infrastructural yeah. issues and such and where, it's, where it's, that's going currently. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, topic too, because uh, uh, what I've always liked is to know where are the user groups, where, where are the students, where are the people who work, where are the people who are visitors, like tourists. And I, I'm always fascinated in getting the, the data around these topics, mm -hmm. but also I'm fascinated in, in behavioral science. So how do they move in, a, how do people move in a station? Why did stay, so many stations in Europe became also the backyard of the city? You know, they became really negative spaces. Rest stations used to, used to be the celebration of uh, traveling. You mm -hmm. know, think of the, yeah, the Grand Central, for instance. I mean, the, the, one of the most beautiful train stations. So, but, but my fascination for, again, uh, not only user groups or people in that sense, but the way how we behave in a day like the, that's how the Möbius House came also together. So how, what do people do in a day? I, funny enough, I interviewed first the children. Uh -huh. 
before the parents, and they didn't like that. The parents said, no, you cannot do that. You, can, you know, we are the ones who are giving you the, the brief. He said, no, but wait, you will learn a lot from what the kids say about what you do in the day. <laughs> So all these things I, I, I like, and, and, and that's how I think also about the way how train stations need to be analyzed in order to make, to make you feel safe in the train station. I don't, a lot of people, when they leave after 10 o'clock, mm. uh, the train station, they feel not safe. Mm -hmm. so, so what we did with Arnhem, we improved an enormous amount of life, liveliness in the train station. We combined two bus stations with the train station. The train people didn't like it. They said, how could you, this is all project, you know, don't, you, these are two other clients, you talk to the bus station people, not to us. And then I said, yeah, but you know how many people are moving around there? There are four times more people moving from one bus station to the regional bus station, and that would be very good for your commercial use in the train station. And then they were actually, oh yeah, that's, you're right, I mean, what, how did you call that your station again? I said, let's call it a hub. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm talking about actually. Sorry, hub is now very known, and everyone talks about hubs and and um, yeah, campuses and all these things. But 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 in that time they didn't understand what a hub was. But so I did a you know hub station with m much more program around it, so that much more liveliness was introduced to the train station. And now people feel safe. It's transparent. You have no column. You have only one column in the in the center of the station, so you see people walking, and it's very lively. Right. Sorry, I'm, I'm suddenly waking up. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sometimes going through my jet lag dip. You notice when I forget names. But another name of a painter you should really uh, watch is Helen Frankenthaler. Yeah, yeah. You know Helen yeah, Frankenthaler. Yeah. She is my, you know, major inspiration to, uh, to you know, I, I, I believe that she, 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 why is she not so known as like, like the Koning, the Koning or someone else? Or Motherwell. Motherwell, yeah. You know, her partner. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so, yeah. oh, Motherwell was actually, they worked together very well. Do you know that, that there is just a uh, book, uh, what came out, of Ninth Street Women? You have to read it. It's actually about, about her and then also um, these other uh, four women, uh, three women uh, in that same period. Yeah. And they talk a lot about Motherwell as well. Yeah. <coughs> okay, we're going to open it up um, to the audience. I think we have some roving mics we have here. So there's at the back, yeah? Uh, yeah, Ben, uh, in one of your pictures, you showed uh, these high-rise buildings in Dubai, and uh, apparently a couple that are planned for South Bank. And I'm just wondering how environmentally sustainable are those? Because I'm thinking of for example, all, all the materials that go into it, the, the embedded energy. Uh, and in uh, Melbourne, we, we do get heat waves uh, periodically. In fact, we had one in uh, February of 2009 where a record was broken. Uh, Melbourne hit 46.4 degrees. And so let, let's say there were a blackout. Uh, what would happen with people up on the 50th floor? Uh, or are these buildings contributing to the heat island effect that I'm sure you're aware of? So a couple of questions. Yeah, good or, questions. Um, actually, the reason, uh, I, is my microphone still working? Yeah. Yes. Um, no, the, you know, especially with the, the Bulao client, we are very intensely going through um, uh, also the idea of how we could possibly make the building also more modular, how we could actually through biophilia and the balconies make sure that the heat wave, we, heat load, sorry, on the facade is not as intense as uh, one should have. Uh, we do an intense amount of uh, studies towards the glass uh, and what kind of glass we're going to use uh, with, with, with the right, like for instance what you saw in the echo building, that is a typical glass whereby we could reduce almost the heat load uh, back to a standard 80% or 80% of a standard glass, double glass facade. So, so there are techniques to uh, reduce heat load on the facade. There are techniques of uh, making high rises more sustainable. But, but yeah, like I said before, it, it is an investment, but it is an investment for the future. Uh, people uh, don't want to live anymore in unsustainable buildings. And late, lately, it's not called environmental 
uh, responsibility we have to take as architects, but particularly that it is that it is also connected to the social aspect or the governance of the way how you deal with uh, uh, sustainability. But but like uh, for instance the, the the project in Dubai, uh, we used uh, very particular fins on the facade so that the, the heat load would you know be almost not or the sunlight would almost not come onto the facade because of the angles we have placed uh, the, um, the the elements to the facade so there are many ways how to of course reduce uh, um, yeah these aspects in 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 sustainable aspects towards a high-rise building but what is the most difficult actually with a high-rise building is to make them energy neg negative and we have examples of projects where we are working on right now, whereby we test that to, to see if, like with the building we did in Delft, that we can even produce energy with a high-rise building, but that's still under, these ideas are still under construction. But it is necessary, you know, you're totally right. I mean, sustainable high-rise buildings are important. And, and, but I would say the social aspect is also very important. Like, like in the Bula project, we, or the Southbank project, what we also do is that we bring people much more together, that people don't live isolated anymore in, in a high-rise building and can't go anywhere with their kids or where they can't meet uh, or can have a party because you know, they have a family of 40 or 50 uh, members in, in their team. Uh, here you have a clubhouse, everything. You know, I mean, it's going to have a cultural set of activities in the project. It's, it's going to be, I think, one of the most unique mixed-use projects uh, in the world because of um, not so much that it is a high-rise project, but it is a, an intense mixed-use project. And the fact that we were able to get, uh, for instance, um, uh, the Pompidou Center, I hope you have heard about it, but that I think is such a major interesting thing that you, that you next to sustainability, uh, make sure that people f feel okay in the location and that they can meet and and again that you that you bring uh, a social aspect to its sustainability in an in a way that that you that you make sure that pe people feel good in a high rise most people don't like to talk in an elevator is my experience they don't like to meet each other in high rise places you know it's it's i i find it even as important as sustainability Another question? It's one down here, Rosanna. <coughs> Hi, Ben. Um, it's Stephanie. Um, I have a question. I just wanted to know what podcasts you listen to or what books you're currently reading or how do you stay inspired? Oh, I didn't. You went too fast for me, sorry. <laughs> what, what podcasts or what books are you reading? How do you stay inspired? What are you, ah. what do you, what is... Like when you've seen so many things and, you know, how do you stay fresh? I, I read a lot. I, I, I love to read, I, but I, honestly, I paint also myself. I do a lot of paint. You know, people are sometimes surprised to come in my atelier. I, you cannot believe it, but I spend at least maybe 35 hours in the week on painting. And, and they, these paintings are not known. But, but hopefully one day, uh, you know, I will show you. But I'm not happy yet <laughs> about going public with my painting, but, but because it's always seen, oh, an architect who's painting, I mean, don't talk about that. But it, 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 it brings sometimes confusion with a lot of people, but I, I paint a lot. And I just said that in, on the plane coming here, I just finished a book um, called The Magician. Uh, it's about the life of Thomas Mann. You should read it. It's a beautiful novel. And this writer uh, wrote this book so well because he went in all the diaries and uh, uh, the history of uh, the life of uh, Thomas Mann. And it's, 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 it's a shocking, beautiful book. I could read it in one go uh, on the plane coming here. So, so that's what, you know, that's my latest book. You can have it. I tell you all my secrets tonight. <laughs> Another question? One. Um, thank you Will, for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, because you were talking a lot about speculation of the future and how technology and architecture sort of goes uh, hand, in, hand in hand, um, 
What would you, um, well, if we speculate, what would you say is sort of the next big thing or, uh, in um, technology or technological uh, development that would change or influence the future of architecture? I mean, we talk about virtual reality, and um, but it can be anything if we speculate. What do you think um, is the next thing? Uh, you know, nobody likes to hear that. Uh, because then I will talk, of course, about the AI and and the metaphors, you know, all these things are happening. And, and we can uh, pull our head around and say that's not going to happen into architecture, but it's already happening. You know, AI is uh, shockingly moving up into the profession, even in my office. You know, if, if I say yeah, mm, I don't believe so much in AI, then they just do it themselves in the office. It's really amazing. It's, it's, it's you know, so... Uh, Artificial intelligence in, you know, for instance, a nice example. We did a competition. Uh, I asked the team, well, okay, then, okay, you use uh, AI uh, formats of how we can maybe speed up another process of designing this competition. So the team went, went into 12 references of other architects, but they said, said that would be quite a good choice for this location, and 12 references of our own project. So, and they mixed that in the AI machine, and they came up with 12 mixed variants for, for um, the op options, I should say, for the location. And, you know, I, of course I was shocked to see that, you know, and, and I never, I didn't like the, 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 I never, I didn't like the, the designs at all, but the fact that you could do this, you know, <laughs> the fact that you could do it in such a short time, in three days, they had 12 variants. I thought it was amazing, and, and, and of course I said, well, if you do this, you know, and then I started to play with it myself, and that is what, what you have to do. So, yeah, it's coming up. Uh, but the fact that data and the built environment and working with data is something already quite new in the relationship to the production of using technology and architecture. So what we, what we now can do with BIM is amazing. You know, the plugins we can make, the, the, the own, our own programs we make, and then pull it into... Uh, BIM, that, that's, that's already quite an, in, a super interesting part of the development. But then what data can do towards neighborhoods, and then that you don't measure where people shop. I think that's not what you, we should do. But what we could do is that we stimulate with data that people communicate with each other. Because in, in the COVID time, we, I didn't fully answer that, we were so isolated in the neighborhoods, we could not talk to each other, you know, we did everything online. But, but, but to stimulate people to do, again, things with each other. I don't know how many of you have uh, visited your friends at home again to cook for them uh, over the last uh, seven months. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe a, f a few of you. But, but, but don't forget, we all lost that, that activity uh, to really invite your friends again and to cook for, you know. And, you know have to, a, yeah, did you I'm, do it? Yeah, I have. A, I mean, I moved into a new apartment during about not even a year ago, and I got a big barbecue, and I usually have somebody over at least once a week. Yeah, good. <laughs> I come. <laughs> yeah, but, but what I mean is that, that through stimulating each other to who knows in that neighborhood that you cook, uh, sorry, that you produce food with each other, that you, cook, that you eat together, you have to think of ideas, what's, and you don't have to be part of it, you, you don't have to, you don't have to, you know, um, uh, produce your own food and if you like to live alone and you prefer to be alone that's all fine but but you know what I mean it's using technology is good but but you have to know how and and in in uh, yeah you have to to you have to design it you have to design data you have to you know you have to be creative with technology technology okay we've got okay time for one more question way at the back <coughs> If I lose my voice, then it's, the, you know, the last person's fault. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mind taking the blame. Uh, hi, Ben. Um, I was really fascinated how you spoke about connectivity throughout, throughout all your projects. Um, one particular one was the Doha Metro Rail. Um, was it hard inculcating connectivity into a train station when there's only a road network and... There's no real connectivity in the city other than the road network. Was it hard or was it particularly easy? Uh, you know, it's not easy to work in, in, in these uh, regions, but, 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 but 
um, luckily enough, f first of all, we were, we, our client was uh, Doha Rail and the Deutsche Bahn uh, company, and they were very, very good to us. They said, this is how we're going to work. We have to find a new strategy of how we can do this quickly, because they had only f seven years, can you imagine, seven years to do this project, but they promised us that they would do it in in, in the way they would work with the regulations also like they did in, um, in Germany. And then, what, what was quite amazing, we had several times uh, conversations with the Shaika. You know, the Shaika is actually one of the most uh, powerful uh, ladies in that, um, in, that, in that place. She is actually... Shaika Moza. Shaika Moza. Shaika is amazing. She, she said, uh, Ben, we, we're going to do this project uh, not only for for the football games you know it's not only there for that because a lot of people think that I want to get everyone out of the car I want to get people to know to get to know each other that they see each other that they meet each other that you have pray pray rooms in the, at the stay stations and that the people would gather so in a way that 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 inspired me so much to make an, an infrastructural network as a social machine it's really a social machine. If you go there, it's really all about, again, people meeting and gathering and getting them out of the car and, and, and making sure that, uh, that with that also we reduce an enormous amount of uh, yeah, sustainable or negative aspects on the environment. Because that, you know, in Doha you cannot drive. It's, it's congested like crazy. Uh, and this metro system um, works like, like literally and figuratively like a train. Mm. So, yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, we, everyone's very happy with the project, but, but hopefully, uh, well, if you, I don't know if you go to the World uh, Soccer uh, Games, but, 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 but you probably can find it on, on the internet. It is quite, quite interesting to see it now for us, for the first time, really fully in use. It's really fantastic. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna stop there. Uh, just wanna end by, first of all, thanking all of you for coming this evening and uh, being able to have the opportunity to, to listen to Ben, but also to Ben and to his office, uh, yeah. his Melbourne office, a lot of who are here with us. Uh, thank you for providing this opportunity for us and for spending the evening with us. Thank I feel you very still, much. still guilty that I was only for a half an hour student. Well, you but know. it was not because Well, of look, I, I always take the premise that, that the real issue was two Dutchmen, you know, Raoul Bunso oh, yeah, teaching was, with me yeah, that was the real and, and Ben. <laughs> so it was not about me, it was about them. That's what and I want to say. <laughs> that was really the case. Yeah, but that's why I'm always, you know, whenever you call me, I call. Yeah? Thank you. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you.